you've messed it up. You're stupid. And today's Daily Dose of Stupid comes to us from Senator Elizabeth Warren. That's right, the Democratic presidential hopeful has done something stupid yet again. So the latest thing that Warren has come out with is that she is backing AOC's new welfare plan. Oh, goody. I do think it's hilarious that somebody that is trying to paint themselves as the most logical person, the one that's the most uh, wonkish, the person that is, you know, really good at math and that kind of thing, that she's teaming up with AOC. That seems like an odd person that you'd want to hitch your wagon to if you're trying to come off as a smart person. But nonetheless, that's what Elizabeth Warren tries to do. So AOC's newest plan is referred to as a just society. That's what they're calling it. And it contains some of the dumbest ideas that you're ever going to see. One of which is rent control. And not just rent control, national rent control. Now, rent control has been an unmitigated disaster in every single place that it's been tried. In fact, they did a survey of economists. I think it was the University of Chicago that, that did this. And they did a study of 21 different metropolitan areas. And in every single one, over 80% of the economists said that it had been an absolute disaster when tried in different places. So rent control is a mess. It always has been. You cannot artificially decide what something's value is. It can't be done. The marketplace has to do that. Because when you try to arbitrarily assign a set value to something, then inevitably it winds up underselling and hurting the person trying to sell or overselling and hurting the person trying to buy. The marketplace does a much better job and does it for free, by the way. What government has to struggle just to, to get somewhere near competent and still screw it up. So national rent control is, it's already something that's been tried over and over and over again. Everybody that has any sense agrees that it's ridiculous and it doesn't actually help. In fact, it usually makes rent worse because it can do things like create a false scarcity or it can artificially keep the prices way too low, which winds up with, with people buying more than they need. So there, there's all kinds of different reasons why rent control is a really, really bad idea. It makes housing less affordable and makes it less available as well. And what happens is then people just tend to build property in places that either don't have rent control or people move out to places that don't have rent control or what they wind up doing is you'll have one person buying more than they need and then have availability that is less for everybody else. So there's a number of reasons why this is a bad idea. And here's the craziest thing about national rent control. How on earth would you have a national rent control when you have in this country places like New York City and the areas right outside Washington, D.C. and L.A., where the cost of living is through the roof, the highest in the world, and you compare that to places like rural Alabama, where the cost of living is practically nothing. I mean, a one-bedroom studio apartment with a bathroom that you share with four other people would be enough to buy you probably a few acres in the state of Alabama with your own house on it. And so the cost of living comparison, there's absolutely no comparison there. How are you going to have a national law that regulates all of that? It can't be done. This idea that people in Washington, D.C. are so much smarter than the rest of us that they can, from D.C., determine what the price of a house should be in Alabama, in Montgomery, in Huntsville, or in Slapout, or Marbury, or Wetumpka, that they know better than the people that live there what the price ought to be. Central planning doesn't work, and that's a perfect example of why it's a bad idea. Another thing it does is it reevaluates poverty considerations. There's a couple reasons why this one's disturbing. One is that it considers internet access a necessity, which it is certainly not. Goodness knows I want as many people to have internet access as possible, considering I'm on the internet right now, so it's really important to me monetarily, 
that people have internet access, but I still wouldn't consider it a necessity. It's not like heat or food. I mean, these are not comparable things to being able to binge watch Netflix. I mean, yes, it's nice, but it's not a requirement. But that's actually the, the least disturbing part of this in the poverty consideration. It also has and assigns people with a worker-friendly score, which includes things like union membership. In other words, they want to incentivize being a member of a union because, of course, they're Democrats. And who are the biggest donors to Democrats? Hmm. Oh, yeah, workers' unions. So they're trying to give incentives to people to join a union, which then turns around and gives campaign donations to Democrats. Funny how that worked out. It's almost like they were trying to do that. And another reason why this is really stupid and disturbing is it's oddly similar to Project Dragonfly in China that they're working on right now trying to give people a social score. In other words, trying to grade how well you're doing as a citizen when it comes to the way that you're living your life. If you're doing things that the government deems as good and worthy, then they reward you with certain things. And if you're not, they punish you or they take things away from you. Now, granted, this doesn't go quite that far, but even the project in China had to start somewhere. And so giving people a social score and social points, it's again another very open attempt to try to control your life from afar to tell you, no, no, we know better than you peons out in flyover country. We'll tell you the way you need to live. We'll tell you what you need to eat. We'll tell you what you need to watch. We'll tell you what unions you need to be a part of, because you're too dumb to figure that out on your own. So we'll take care of that. It's absolutely asinine. And this part, it doesn't surprise me that Warren is in favor of, because even though she's not as progressive as AOC on some things, the truth is, Elizabeth Warren has always been and will always continue to be, even when she was considered more of a moderate senator. senator she always was a big believer in centralized government control. She believes she's smarter than everybody else, and because of that, she should be running your life, not you. That's silly to think that you could even do that without her. Another thing it does is it makes it illegal to deny welfare based on any legal status. Now, that's interesting. So if you're an illegal alien specifically, this is one of the things that this bill points out, if you're an illegal alien, then you can't be denied welfare. doesn't matter that you're not a citizen. doesn't matter that the people paying taxes may have been in America and, and been citizens since the days of the Revolutionary War, and you showed up 25 minutes ago with no skills and nothing to contribute to society. doesn't matter. You get welfare. We're going to take their tax dollars and give it to you. Oh, and to add insult to injury, and this should surprise no one, that would also include ex-convicts. So in other words, once you've, paid, once you've paid your debt to society, if you're just not making enough money, then we'll take it from the hard-working, law-abiding citizens that are doing their part and are contributing to society, we're going to take their money and give it to you, the ex-con. Now, once somebody's paid their debts to society, yeah, by all means, it, once they've done their sentence, I don't want to hold anything against them. And by all means, go out, live your life. As long as you're obeying the law after that point, I don't have a problem with you. But the idea that we would be giving welfare to those people, that we would be supplementing their lifestyle with welfare by taking money from law-abiding citizens, how does that make any sense? That's what I'm having a hard time figuring out here. And when you're talking about a just society, because remember that is the title of this thing, a just society, you're really trying to tell me that stealing money from the hardworking people, and by the way, AOC's policies would necessarily increase that tax burden. You're telling me taking more of their money is just and giving that money to the people that broke the law that's what's going to make us a just society. You've got to be kidding me. All right, and then finally, this bill is... This part's kind of symbolic, but I think it may be the most important part of the bill because it would classify health care, housing, and healthy food as a human right. 
Now, there's a reason that this is absurd. First of all, you need a constitutional amendment for that. You can't just start making up human rights. I mean, I know that the Supreme Court seems to do it all the freaking time, but no, you can't just make up a right out of whole cloth out of thin air. If it's actually a human right, then you need to be able to go through the arduous process of getting a constitutional amendment codified into law in our Constitution. Now, I think that that's a ridiculous idea, but if you think that it's a human right, that needs to be the way that you do it. These half measures where you're just going to pass a law and think that that's going to be good enough? No, something like that needs to actually be a constitutional amendment. There's no reason to try to pass this into law otherwise. We don't have any other human rights that come from other arbitrary laws. They come from the Bill of Rights in the Constitution of the United States. And so AOC is just trying to cut corners here. But more importantly, and getting to the philosophical level, food and uh, healthy food specifically, so not even just like regular food, it has to be healthy food, whatever the heck that means. But healthy food and housing and health care cannot be human rights. Why? Why is it important to know why those things cannot be human rights? Because they require somebody else. They require consent. Because what you own, your property, is that which you have the right to deny to others. If I have a house, for example, and I don't, but if I have a house, and I cannot keep other people from coming into my house and using anything inside the house that they want, it's not my house. I mean, even if my name is on the deed, if it's perfectly legal for anybody to come in and just crash on my couch without my permission, whether I want them there or not, it's not my house. My car. If at any time there was a law that said, no, whenever you're driving, if somebody jumps in the car and, and says, no, no, I want you to take me to this place, then it's not my car. I don't own that car if that is the case. If somebody with no legal penalties can just take my car for a ride, then it's not my car. And the same is true of labor. If I am a doctor and I have spent years in medical school and years more in practicing medicine in, in the different area that I'm in, whatever special area that is, and someone says, treat me, and I can't say no. Now, whether or not it's right to say no or not is a whole different scenario, but just dealing with the hypothetical in front of us here, if I'm not allowed to say no, then I am your slave. If I'm not allowed to say no, then I can't deny my experience, my wisdom, my knowledge. I'm not allowed to deny those things to you, and thus I do not own them. Same thing for farming. And by the way, I have been involved directly in agriculture before. I have grown animals and plants that people consume. I have done that and sold it to people, gotten money from it. So I have been engaged in agriculture. I know a little bit more about this side of it. If I have my years of experience in growing corn or tomatoes or beef, if I have all of that, but you're hungry, so you say, no, I have a right to food, therefore I have a right to the food growing there in your yard, well, then it's not my food. If I can't keep you from eating it, then it's not mine. It's the community's or yours or however you want to look at that. So that's why food and resources, commodities in other words, they cannot be rights because they require somebody else to act on your behalf to obtain them. Now, I have no problem with somebody growing their own food or treating themselves medically or building their own house. That's fine. If, if it's their material, they didn't steal it or, or get it through ill-gotten gains and they want to build it themselves or, or fix themselves up or, or eat their own food, by all means, more power to you, brother. Go ahead. But you can't require somebody else to gather it for you and then say, no, no, I'm entitled to it because it's my right. There is no such thing as a right that requires the consent or the labor of somebody else. There's just not. It's a natural, inborn, God-given God thing that you have from the time of your birth. You don't have a house from the time that you're born. Your parents might, but you don't. You don't have food from the time of your birth. Other people can provide you with that, but you don't. 
You don't have a right to property that somebody else gathered. There are other people that may have the responsibility of providing for things in the case of your parents. Obviously, that's an example. But there's a difference in that and you having a right to something. Let's look at sex. A lot of people treat sex as though it's a right. That's why they'll say, hey, you can't... Um, you, you can't deny me birth control because they treat, they're treat they treating sex as though it is a right, that I have a right to do that. It's something that I have to be able to do. That's absurd, and the reason that it would be is because what does it require? More than one person. Because if sex is a right, then there's no such thing as rape. Because it was my right to have sex with the people that I wanted to. Well, food and housing and medical care are the same thing. You don't have a right to what is somebody else's. You don't have a right to them. You don't have a right to their experience or their knowledge or their labor. You don't. Those are commodities. And when government treats that as commodities and, re and it respects the property, whether it's intellectual and intangible properties like wisdom and understanding or the physical property like food and housing that we just talked about, when it respects those rights, we get a better society. It's when government stops respecting those rights or thinks that it can centrally plan those things and distribute them evenly, that we have millions of people starving like we did under the Soviet Union or under communist China. It's when they start thinking of those things as the property of the collective and you don't really own that, that's where we run into problems. When we respect people's property and expect them to gather and do for themselves and provide for themselves, they start producing more. That's the way to build a truly just society. And what this all boils down to, and I know that was a long explanation, why is, why is Senator Warren doing this? Why is she the only, the only Democrat senator so far that has endorsed this plan? Because Senator Warren is the out-of-touch old grandma that is trying desperately, desperately to get the kids to think she's cool. That's what's going on here. She really, really wants the kids to think she's the cool grandma that can get on board with the new ideas because she knows she desperately needs those votes. She's trying so hard to win over the Bernie Sanders crowd because she knows that if she can do that and if she can unite the Bernie bros to her cause, then she might have a chance at overtaking Biden. That's all this is about. This is just political posturing. I don't know whether or not Elizabeth Warren agrees with a lot of it. I think, as I laid out, the parts that are about central planning, I think she absolutely does believe in those. But I don't know how much Elizabeth Warren is on board with the rest of the stuff. But ultimately, that's what she's trying to do. It's pathetic. She tries so hard, just like she did in that video, where she's like, oh yeah, um, Fortnite and stuff. I'm going to grab like... A uh, beer. It was so embarrassingly ungenuine. She's trying so hard to be somebody that she's not. And this is just one more example of that. She's trying so hard to be relevant and get young people to think that she's cool and that she can get on board with these new ideas. It's shameless pandering. It's frankly very well disguised shameless pandering, but it is shameless pandering. Nonetheless, she's really wanting AOC to kiss the ring so that she can sort of get those younger Democrat socialists on her side. But I think that the reason that Warren is doing this is AOC is ridiculously unpopular, even amongst Democrats. They took that poll among Democrat voters, and she couldn't even score over 30%. She's not even liked by her fellow Democrats, especially the ones in swing states, especially the ones in Iowa and New Hampshire that she's going to be coming up against. Warren is in the upcoming primaries. So she's trying so hard to be liked by AOC and her ilk that she doesn't realize that winning over their vote is really not going to help her all that much. There might be some Bernie bros that migrate over there, but the Bernie bros don't really like her either. And I don't think that this is going to be a move that helps her much when it comes to this election. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that I am. And you see, what's going on here is that despite the fact that AOC is wildly unpopular amongst Democrats, she's currying that side of the vote because Elizabeth Warren is a political animal. And like a lot of political animals, Republicans and Democrats, 
they really do think that the way that the Washington Post opinion column reads or that Rachel Maddow talks, that's what Americans are really thinking. It's not. So, yeah, you might win some brownie points with those people, but the idea that you're going to get people in middle America that just believe in a big welfare state but don't want socialism, that you're going to be able to win over those people by doing stupid stuff like this, it's a bad political strategy. And I think that it's eventually going to wind up blowing up in Pocahontas' face. Hey, to make sure you get all the updates, you need to go ahead and subscribe and click that little notification bell down there. That gets you a notification every time I post a new Bible lesson or political commentary. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't subscribe, it's because you hate America and Jesus. But I can't think of any other reason you wouldn't subscribe.